This video is going to cover making potassium dichromate, K2Cr2O7. The reason I'm doing this is because it's an intermediate step for making a reducing agent. I'll talk about that more later. To make our potassium dichromate, we're going to be using ammonium dichromate. And just as a warning, both are known to be carcinogenic and very dangerous to work with. Some quick history here. The French chemist Louis-Nicolas Vauquelin first discovered chromium compounds in naturally occurring chromium minerals that he found in the Ural Mountains. Of course, that's not in France, and he went there to discover different compounds, and what he found he named chromium because it comes from the Greek word chroma, meaning color, and it's the Cr207 component of both potassium and ammonium dichromate that gives it its color, which of course is like an orange or reddish orange. Potassium dichromate is a strong oxidizer, much like ammonium dichromate and it's been used for titrations, leather tanning, as a dye, not surprising, and in photography. I'm going to be using the potassium dichromate as an intermediate step in making the formaldehyde, which was the reducing agent I was talking about earlier. And just once again, these are very toxic. Both the ammonium and potassium dichromate are hazardous. Please handle them carefully. For our materials, we need, of course, ammonium dichromate, 80 grams, potassium hydroxide, 35.56 grams. Turns out, for every 1 gram of potassium hydroxide, we need 2.25 grams of ammonium dichromate in order to work out the stoichiometry. And of course we need water to dissolve both of these in. The reaction for what we're going to be doing is a double displacement reaction. It's the ammonium dichromate plus 2 potassium hydroxide yields the potassium dichromate and 2 ammonia gas and 2 waters. Of course this ammonia gas is going to be released and I don't want to waste it so I'm going to try to use that to strengthen some ammonia uh, solution that I already have. Because the uh, chromate ion right here, the Cr207, is the same in both of these. They look identical. And this is going to be an unusual reaction because of that. As we work this through here, we're not going to see any change in the color of these crystals, which will look exactly like these crystals and vice versa. So that should be interesting, but it also means that at the end of this, we need to test what we have. In doing this experiment, if we add too much of the ammonium dichromate, we'll end up with extra ammonium dichromate mixed with the potassium chromate in the final mixture. If we add too much potassium hydroxide, we'll form the chromic ion and therefore we'll form potassium chromic which will be mixed with our potassium dichromic and of course that's not good. So these measurements right here of 80 and 35.56 are very precise in order to avoid both of these from happening. In our methods, number one, mix the solids with water. Talked about that. Now this doesn't have to be that complicated but because I want to save that ammonia gas and, and, and put it to work, this is what I'm going to be, do, be doing. I have the addition funnel up here which will have the potassium hydroxide in it. And down here, we'll have the ammonium dichromate solution. So as this drips through, we'll be producing our potassium dichromate down here, but the ammonia gas will get released, come up here, which is my backwash catcher, so to speak. Gas will continue on and go into what I already have, which is a 10% solution of ammonium hydroxide, hopefully strengthening that. Of course, it'll be an ice and mixing because cold ammonia absorbs ammonia gas better. After all of the potassium hydroxide has been added, I'm going to let this mix for some time to make sure everything's reacted well. And then I'm going to pour it into a larger beaker and heat it. You'll notice in the reaction we just went over that there are two waters produced. So not only are the solids dissolved in water, but we're going to produce more water uh, because of the reaction itself. So I'm going to heat that, get rid of a lot of the water, and then we'll chill it in the potassium dichromate. Crystal should come out of solution pretty easily. Then we're just going to simply filter this. I don't know if I'll use just a gravitation filter or I guess gravity filter or um, suction filter. I'm not sure yet, but... Either way, we'll take the crystals and dry them, and then we need to test them. And that's because the potassium dichromate we make and the ammonium dichromate we started with are going to look exactly the same. So that's it. Let's go make our potassium dichromate. I have the 300 milliliters of distilled water in there like we talked about. I'm just going to start the magnetic stir up here, and we're going to add our ammonium dichromate slowly. There is more than enough water here for this to dissolve. As I mentioned, the idea here is just to get it dissolved so you can use more than you actually need. The ammonium dichromate is completely dissolved. Next, we're dissolving the potassium hydroxide. Get the stir going again. 150 milliliters of distilled water. The potassium hydroxide is completely dissolved. I'll turn down the magnetic stir. You can see what an exothermic reaction is. It is. Uh, add that potassium hydroxide to water because of the steam around the top of the beaker there. I've got this little mess here just to show you something. So these are obviously rubber stoppers and what was once really nice silicone tubing. And I can show you after using this for both ammonia and hydrochloric 
or for chlorine gas, uh, they're pretty much become useless. But since I drilled the holes in here, I hate to get rid of the uh, the whole design there. So what I found works is if you take a, a shrink wrap tubing, cover it up good right there, and then you put the other end in here with some fresh silicone tubing and you heat that, it works. So you can see that I covered each end by probably at least three quarters of an inch, but the uh, tubing here has an adhesive. You can see it squeeze out there a little bit, which makes this work. Without that adhesive, this could come apart, and if you're working with something dangerous like chlorine gas, you would not want to do this. But this is a setup for the experiment, as I already mentioned earlier. So we're going to have the potassium hydroxide up there, the ammonium dichromate down here, and we're going to drip it in. Exothermic reaction, ammonia gas is produced. I will not have the heat on here. No need for it. Um, the gas will come down in here and then come around into this flask right here and this flask will contain around 10 percent ammonia already this is to catch any backflow because once gas stops being produced over here you'll get some suction and it will start to suck straight out of here unless you have something in the middle like this to catch it and save it we're going to start by pouring in our potassium hydroxide into this addition funnel here my camera can't get high enough to see the whole thing but you'll see it coming down when it does You always want to do this first because if by chance your um, mechanism down below isn't stopping this properly, it'll start dripping into what you had already have poured the ammonium um, into the bottom there and you would have a real problem because it would start reacting and you would not be ready for it. I meant to say ammonium dichromate, but I'm putting the uh, top plug here with some silicone grease just to close this. This is how this things work because it is a pressure equalizing additional funnel pouring in the ammonium dichromate all done check this out the beaker is yeah that's orange even though i poured everything out of it wow next we just need to add the tubing and the rubber stopper here to direct the ammonia gas out of there and now we start dripping our potassium hydroxide into the ammonium dichromate to make our potassium dichromate. Before we do that, just checking on this other end, I have the 10% ammonia solution in there. The top I sealed with this crumpled up uh, plastic wrap just to keep the tube in place, but also to keep the ammonia gas down here as much as possible. Now we don't have to put the tubing into the ammonia. It usually dissolves really well, especially if the ammonia solution is cold. So I'll have ice around here. But because I have this backstop here, I'm just gonna make sure the ammonia gas gets in there by sticking it right into the liquid. And you can really only do that if you have something to save it if it does backwash. So just be careful if you do it. You can hear the ammonium dichromate solution mixing below. And I'm just going to slowly open this potassium hydroxide solution above. And I'm really going to keep this slow. I said that once already, but yeah. Maybe one drop every few seconds just to see how this goes. That's a good rate, I think. As I discussed, because the volumes of both of the solutions is actually rather large, just to make sure everything dissolved well, it will take quite a bit of mixing to make sure the uh, two uh, chemicals come in contact properly uh, within the round bottom flask here. So this is going to go on for quite a while. It took a full hour to uh, add all the potassium hydroxide solution, but it's out. Uh, you can clearly see the exothermic reaction to the steam, the inside of this round bottom flask here. Uh, what I'm going to do at this point is let this mix for a long time. Uh, because potassium um, dichromate and ammonium dichromate are the same color, uh, it's hard to differentiate uh, what is exactly happening. But since we have stoichiometric ratios in there, um, just letting this mix for a long time is the best thing to do. On this end, gas is being formed. There are some very, very tiny bubbles that are coming out, but mostly what I think is happening because the ammonia is so cold, it's uh, absorbing the gas right into the liquid as the stuff spins around, which is not totally surprising. So yeah, we'll have to test this later possibly. We'll see. Two hours later. It's been two hours and this has been mixing, I think, long enough. So I'm gonna turn down the magnetic stir and obviously I've got some things to take apart here. So I'm gonna do that and I will be back. I'm just going to transfer this now to a larger beaker so that we can heat it and get rid of a lot of the water that's already in here. Okay, 
Next step is to heat this up and get rid of the water like I said. There is no clear end point, so it's going to be a little difficult to know exactly when to stop. But I'm going to try to get rid of at least half, maybe two-thirds of the water that's in here. Hopefully, that'll be enough to get the potassium dichromate to crystallize. It took four hours to get this low. I was gently heating it because at higher temperatures, the potassium dichromate does break down. So I'm done here. It's down to about 250 milliliters, which is I think around a third, no, just slightly more than a third of what we had. So now it's just a matter of cooling this down. This has been sitting out for about an hour in 60 degree weather, and you can clearly see the potassium dichromate crystals starting to collect, which is a really great sign. It's been an hour and a half. Look at all the crystals there, but I think they've slowed down a bit. I am going to put this in the fridge just to see if any more will come out of solution. All right, into the fridge this goes. If there's not a lot more crystal formation here, I may heat this up even more. We just want to get out of there as much as we can. It's 24 hours later. I didn't plan on leaving it in here this long, so I really don't know what I'm going to find. Oh, yeah, there's definitely more. Not a lot more? Maybe. I don't know. What I'm going to do then is filter this, and uh, I might take the uh, filtrate, the liquid that's left, and uh, boil it down some more. We'll see, but I want to get these crystals out of here. Okay, before I start vacuum filtering this, which I decided to do, I'm going to break this up. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, those crystals are on the bottom. Pretty good, like a block almost. But they succumb to some stainless steel. Okay, I'm going to let that run for a little bit, dry it out really good, I'll be back. If orange is your favorite color, you must really like this. Well, it stopped dripping, I have some cold distilled water, now potassium dichromate is soluble in water of course, but this is really cold, which will reduce the amount that actually dissolves, so I'm going to just very lightly and gently spray some in here, just to get rid of any impurities. Okay, that's good, it stopped dripping, so let's turn this off here. Now, I have a lot down here of the uh, filtrate, and I am going to boil this down, but I'm going to leave that for later. For now, I'm going to take these, and we'll move them um, onto something to dry them. I'm just going to air dry them. Just a matter of time for this to air dry. I don't think it's going to take that long. Okay, all dry, real nice. Uh, I'm not going to weigh it yet, because... Here is what the filtrate did. I boiled it down and put it back into the freezer, or actually the fridge, and there are a ton of crystals in there. So yeah, they belong in with that stuff, and I need to do that, and then we'll move on. Just drying these uh, crystals from the second batch, and what's very noticeable right away is how small these crystals are. They like pile up, whereas these were obviously much bigger. This batch right here, I took it right off the hot plate and put it in the fridge. This one sat out in 60 degree weather, for three or four hours and then I put it in the fridge. So you can see the rapid cooling really decreased the crystal size. Science at work right there. The second batch here is completely dry. So let's put that in here to weigh it. And then I'll just pour what's in that little container there in here also. So we got around 15 grams there. And quite a bit more here of course. Okay, 55 grams. The theoretical, you, the theoretical yield is around 93 grams or so. So we're over 50%, probably close to 60 here. Yeah, it's not the best, but of course I'm okay with it. I'm not going to redo this entire uh, experiment just to get more. Uh, but now we got to move on and test our potassium dichromate. Okay, here we go with this test. This test is actually really simple, but it doesn't look like it does it. But I'll go over it with you real quick. So in this beaker right here is the ammonium dichromate we started with. And over here is the potassium dichromate, of course, that we made. These are two strips of dry pH paper right here. This is distilled water. This is sodium hydroxide. And this is distilled water that I acidified just slightly to bring out this test better uh, just by blowing into the water. Uh, my carbon dioxide created some carbonic acid in there a little bit, and so this is ever so slightly acidic distilled water. You'll see what I mean as we go along why that's going to help. When sodium hydroxide, right here, is added to each of these, uh, it of course will react, but the difference between the two is the ammonium dichromate will release ammonia gas, which we saw we used potassium hydroxide earlier. That ammonia gas is basic, 
And when I wet these two different um, pH paper pieces, the one on this side, the ammonium dichromate, will turn blue from the basic ammonia, where this one will not, proving that this is potassium dichromate. The first thing I'm going to do is add some of this slightly acidified distilled water to these pH pieces because uh, I just want to make sure they're really well soaked by the time we do the actual test. And you can see that it doesn't change the color of the paper that much. Regular distilled water, which is close to seven, maybe slightly over, would have turned these slightly blue and it would have made the uh, ammonia coming in contact with them less pronounced, I guess. So that's why I made it acidic. Next, I'm going to add just regular distilled water to each of these, about 15 milliliters. I'm going to get this as close as I can. I'm going to mix those off camera. I move things closer so you can see this better. The pH paper is slowly taking on a darker hue, but let's do this quickly here. I'm going to add the sodium hydroxide here and here. Now, obviously, neither one is completely dissolved, but that's all right. Very difficult to tell from where you're at, but trust me, the one on the left is turning much darker. I'm going to get a close-up of this. You can see our potassium dichromate on the right. That pH paper did darken earlier, but it didn't really change. Well, you can see on the left there the dramatic difference, how dark that is. That is from the ammonia gas being given off, proving this is ammonium dichromate, and this isn't. It's potassium dichromate. Excellent. For the last test here, I have uh, ammonium dichromate on the left and potassium dichromate on the right. They're both on... U.S. quarters. I couldn't find anything else I had that was made of metal right now. So um, I'm going to burn both of them. The one on the left will spark because that's what ammonium dichromate does uh, and it can self-ignite once it's been uh, heated enough. Uh, potassium dichromate on the right will not throw off any sparks. It'll kind of just shrivel up into these dark balls uh, and it does um, not burn or self-ignite easily. So I'm going to turn the lights off here and then we'll do it. First one I'm going to do is the ammonium dichromate which was on the left. You can see how it sparks like that and throws off the chromium oxide. Second one I'm going to do on the right, which is a potassium dichromate. And you can see the difference right away. No sparking. What's happening is it's shriveling up into these uh, small balls of chromium oxide. I'll show you this right after. Okay. You can see the aftermath of both. This is all chromium oxide right here. That's kind of been spit around. This is also chromium oxide, but all shriveled up into a small ball. Okay. We're done with the testing. I think we proved we did make potassium dichromate.